Okay, thank you guys so much for coming and thank you for all of your patience. We realize that this was supposed to have started 20 minutes ago and we're so sorry. Um, so um, before I introduce our wonderful guest speaker, I just want to quickly thank the political science department, um, the history department, and the center of student involvement for not just funding us, but funding us like a week ago when we barged into their offices like in a panic um, because we are not good at planning ahead. Um, <laughs> and so, um, we also just want to thank you all for being here. Um, your curiosity and your activism is very, very essential to this campus. Um, with that being said, let me introduce you to our speaker, Hassan Ahmad. Um, Hassan is an architect and an engineer of the village of Batiyah from Palestine. Um, he's t today he's going to be speaking on his experiences networking internationally and locally um, and the fight to save his village from the Israeli separation wall made to cut um, through his village of Batiyah. He'll be speaking about his work in his village, how it came to be a UNESCO World Heritage Site, and how external influences affect Batia on a daily basis on the ground. Um, so without further ado, um, here is Hassan. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, I would like to thank you for attending tonight in this conference, and I would like to thank all the team who worked hard to make this happen and make my journey uh, to the States finally. Um, my name is Hassan Muhammad. Again, I'm an engineer from uh, Palestine. Many people, when I pronounce Palestine, they think it's Pakistan. So I have to insist, no, it's Palestine. Um, I was raised and born in this village, where it's known but here it's located just between the most two important cities uh, of Bethlehem and Jerusalem. And the idea where we just started um, to focus on this, on this village since 2005, mainly. That's when me and my colleagues we started a collective project on how to think about new ideas to preserve the area and what we should do to make our voice as Palestinians is well known all over the world. Not only uh, locally, but how to reach an international level. So we start to think about the creating First, the statistic study about the village, collecting data from, from the area, from the ground, learning about our village, first of all. So before I come to tell you about my place, I should know it well. I should know the history, I should know the location, I should know about the conflict, how, does it, how it has been changed because of the occupation, and all these aspects. For me, it was a very important uh, process to go ahead. So, the village itself, it used to be exist like really since a long time, starting from the early Iron Age or the Canaanite period, where this means around 3000 BC, and this is where the first human uh, civilization used to use the place as part of the road connects between Jerusalem to the coastal area connecting to Jaffa. Then, through our study, we discovered many other elements and ruins that dates back to the Roman, to the Byzantine, to the Crusader, to the Mamluk, to the Umayyad, to the Ottoman periods. So we decided to first of all classify all these uh, uh, remains and also to understand its um, importance nowadays. But of course you, you all know that we had also another aspect of our current history which started in 1948 specifically after the Israeli occupation for our country that took over most over, over than 531 Palestinian town and city which changed a lot of our life, daily life or our current daily life existence. So Batir was part of Jerusalem province until 1948. Then after the Israelis they took over Jerusalem, they disconnect us totally from being part of of Jerusalem, so people had to seek access and services to the closest city nearby, which is Bethlehem. So we've become totally the first or the last, again, because some people from 48, they call it the last Palestinian village on the border line, but in 1967, it became the first Palestinian on the front line with the border. That also played another role. But uh, before I go more in, the, in details about that, I would just to ask you if you heard about um, the Derya Seed massacre. It's a famous massacre which has been done by Israeli militias and Zionist uh, groups 
who attacked this village in the night of 9th of April 1948. It's only four kilometers away from Batir, from my village. And the impact of this massacre has influenced all the surrounding villages. There were over the 19 villages around us that the people had to survive living to seek for a safe place. I refuse totally to say people run away or people left their villages and just left it empty. People, as a natural reaction, they had to survive their living and to save their families. So they were searching for safe places where they can keep their families in and then fight against these militias and the Zionist groups. So Batir was one of these villages and the people had to find some other safe places nearby. And in Arab culture, also, we have a definition called Tanaib. Tanaib, that I ask for support or I ask for for help when I go from place to another. So when people had to move from their villages, they look or they would search for their neighbor villages to search for uh, help or support. So people of Batir, they moved to Bejala and to some areas in between Bethlehem and Bejala. They are the small towns nearby. But another group, they refused to leave they decided to stay over and to act like the village is still inhabited, full of people. But how they would do that? They were only 13 persons. Out of 1,023 persons, the population of the people of Batir was at that time. So they used to think about techniques to show the village is still full and inhabited. So they went through all the empty houses of the old village they start collecting candles, lamps, olive oil lamps to light them during the night to show that there is people living there. Early morning before sunrise, they would also go through the houses to collect whatever they found, uh, clothes, blankets, to hang them on the rooftops of the houses like there are people living there. They would go in the field where we have the aqueduct system, open the water in between the terraces and make it flood and then they start screaming on each other like that they are doing their farming activity. That also part of their daily practices. But also they did a wonderful thing that made the Zionist group think that they are weaponed and strong enough to fight. These 13 persons, they decided to create several spots in the village where they make a big fire. And around each fire, they would put kind of structure, wooden structure, stones, whatever. So when they light the fire, it gives a shade of things sitting around it, like there are people sitting around it. And each one of them, he would stick a thick leaf of two to three inches on his back, like it's a gun, it's a weapon. And they keep walking back and forward, like they are the guards protecting these people who are sitting around the fire. So this prevented totally the Zionist groups from uh, getting into the village. But also, one of the other things that's showing in the presentation, we had a railway track which was built during the Ottoman period. It's exactly in the same area where I'm explaining you. This railway was created long time before the creation of the State of Israel, as now they claim it's an Israeli train. No, it's a Palestinian train which was created in 1890, and the first train passed from the village was in 1892 and they created a railway station that was known as Batir Railway Station and it was a main connection between the village to Jerusalem and as well to the western side to Jaffa. So most of the elders in the village nowadays remember their daily life and activities and studies where they were able to study in Jaffa and Jerusalem at that time where unfortunately nowadays we as Palestinians from the village we are only eight kilometers it's about six miles maybe, or 5.5 miles away from Jerusalem, but we are not able to go there. And we are about 30 miles from Jaffa, and we are not able to go to because we are Palestinian ID holders. We cannot go to Israel unless we go through specific checkpoints where we have specific permits if it's applicable in some cases to get it. But in the normal situation, you are not able to do that. So, in 1948, I will just go back to that, after the, the people started this act, or this show to save the village and to make it visible, they have learned that both armies, the Jordanian and the Israeli army at that time, 
they intended to start uh, stopping the war and starting an uh, agreement which was known as Rhodos Agreement. Rhodos is a small uh, Greek island that the agreement was named after. And to clarify or to start drawing down what's known of the border that it created West Bank, Gaza Strip, and showed the rest of the historical Palestine given a new name known as Israel. So the people of Batir, or especially this group, they learned about this story, and the war is getting shut or shutting down. So they start going to the places where the rest of the population had stayed and said that the village is safe, you should come back. So they brought back all the people of Batir at the beginning of 1949, January to March 1949. We were the first Palestinian who had right of return at that time, because today one of the main rights we are claiming as Palestinians is right of return. So this prevented the village from being occupied at that time. But that doesn't mean um, we survived after 1967, which I will talk about later. But what was important also um, about this, that the people when they returned, they had, lost, they had lost a year of their farming land, of their seasons of cultivation and so on. So they were totally in a situation that they would need a support to survive. So there was a brilliant guy in the village at that time called Hassan Mustafa. And this guy, he was one of the first educated people in the village who got a bachelor degree from the American University in Cairo in 1932. He came back and he started collecting the names of the people who had been registered as refugees. Because just right after 48, we start hearing the name of refugees in Palestine where they were Palestinian refugees moving from their towns to new places where it was adopted by ANORWA, which is United Nations for Work and Relief, giving them some means and supports and tents to survive. So these guys collected the names of the people, went to the ANORWA and he said, I have refugees as well, but they are not in the camp. They live somewhere else. So we used to took boxes, packages, it was called in English, but people when they transfer it to Arabic, they call it bukje. Bukje was the box or the uh, food box that they had from Anurwa and bring it back to the village, then divide it on all the people to make them survive. So that was Hassan Mustafa, who I will get back to him later on. But with our current history nowadays, as uh, you may hear or learn about the Israeli plans, took place in 2000 after the second intifada to start building a barrier or a wall to split between many Palestinian cities and Israel or in the front line cities or towns. So they claim that they're going to build this separation wall as a security wall, but the fact on the ground was proving it's something else. It's more land grabbing it's more controlling natural resources, it's more bringing and facilitate the existence of the illegal settlements in West Bank. So we just uh, were part of this plan and we just faced a new uh, danger, a new occupation, apart from our daily occupied life, is coming to destroy our future, it's coming to split us from our farming land, from our access to the surrounding area and we decided to think how we would resist, how we would prevent such a crime to be on our land or in our village. In addition to the uh, separation wall plan, there was another plan nearby to build a new illegal settlement next to uh, our village with almost 14,000 housing units to bring more settlers to live in our area and the big plan was to create a complex of settlements to connect between Jerusalem and Bethlehem. I think I have a map here where it will show it uh, better. So this dark grey spots is the Israeli illegal settlements built in all the area. Over there you would see um, Jerusalem and the orange spot there is the old city of Jerusalem. 
Then the Hadith was to connect all these gray spots of the settlement to this hatched area where we have a deer here in the middle. And this is our neighbor village called Hussan. And the blue spots in here, there are more other Palestinian villages. This sneaky in line, this is the plan for building the wall. So the idea it was to isolate us from here to have any connection to Jerusalem and here to Bethlehem and to create this huge block of settlements to connect it with Hebron. So we start thinking what we could do, what we should do to define our rights, to um, prevent this, as you may know, Israel doesn't consider any international law. And building the separation wall was against international law. But that doesn't stop the Israelis from doing that. 731 kilometer uh, of the wall has been built all over West Bank. From the northern part of Jenin and Tulkarim, all the way down to the south to Hebron area. So we decided to look at the point from a different strategy. We did a very small analysis. What did the Israeli plan were? What was the Palestinian reaction? And what was the result? So, Israeli plans always to create more complicity on the situation. So there will be no future for creating two state solutions as Palestinian and Israeli, or to make any possible solution for Palestinians to have their right of freedom to continue. Second part of the analysis, what was the Palestinian reaction about all this, building the illegal settlements, the creation, the separation wall, and so on. And the result, what's the result always? Most of the time, Israel do what it plans, it's implemented on the ground, we regret, we condemn, and then what's the result? They always win, and they do what they want, and we always lose. A year by year, we are losing more and more of the country. So here we started like to stop for a bit and to think from another perspective. How could we do a new example to make us as Palestinians at least win for one time? That's where we start to think out of the box. We started um, landscape study and research about all the area of Batir, which is around 8,000 donors of land and we start to study every single thing on the surface of the land and also underground. So we studied hydrography, geology, land cover, land use, natural and cultural landmarks, everything that you can imagine. And many people looked at us and they said, oh, you will stop the Israeli plans by studying your, uh, your landscape and then you would prevent the building the wall? Are you crazy? We said, let's see. Let's see where we're going to reach. Let's see where we're going to fight up. So we started creating our own maps, our own survey to understand, first of all, where we are standing. What kind of values do we have to protect? And what's going to be the impact of the Israeli plans on our area? So I will go just through some slides to show you some surveys of some parts of these plans that we did. For example, this one, it's showing Maybe it's not clear on the projector, but it's showing a lot of thin gray lines on all over the territory, which is known in Palestine as Sanasi, or the dry stone walls, or the uh, retaining walls that the farmers has built since thousands of years. When we, show, when we saw the amount of these terraces or of these walls in the village, which dates back to 5,000 years ago, mm -hmm. it's a big value to talk about we discovered 554,000 linear meter of this dry stone wall built in the area. Then we start to think, who built them? For what? How much effort? Uh, what's the history of these walls? And we start to dig behind this subject, and this, is what, this was only one subject in total. But then, we start discovering natural water springs, uh, more monumental stones, footpaths, which were the connection between Batir, Jerusalem, and uh, Bethlehem, caravan routes that the Romans, the Byzantines, they used at the time. Um, the cultural landmarks where it means also the olive groves, the uh, 
olive trees that existed since that time, as well as the uh, terrace mattress, or what we call also the kasser, which is this kind of structures that has been since hundreds of years there. So we start to classify all these aspects. So I will show you some examples of what we were trying to survey, as this is part of an aqueduct system, and each plot of these is part of the cultivated land that the farmers, they have been using for the past 5,000 years, until nowadays. So we start to think how we could protect these values. Over here, it shows the old village of Patir, and below is part of the ancient terraces with the aqueduct system that distributes water all over the area. In addition to this narrow path that connects down to go to Jerusalem until 1948, and after that it stopped. This, I'm taking you in a tour, a little bit to show you a tear from here, but I wish next time that uh, we could invite you all and we can take you an actual tour there. This structure is part of an ancient structure for a lime kiln that existed in Batir in the 17th century and it was a place where the people they used to produce the lime in place of cement to use it for the old structures. So one of these structures doesn't exist anymore in any other area. This is another source of a water spring where we have seven water springs in the area with seven aqueducts. This is an Islamic shrine that also we discovered out there. This is part of an old court of the village. This is a very special uh, area. It's called the Seven Widows Quarter. And it's the root of all the families of Batir where they used to live inside. Uh, here, it's another part of an aqueduct Roman system. Another example of the dry stone systems or the terracing system. And as well, this one. This is part of an ancient Canaanite watchtower. Canaanite, it's almost 3000 BC. And it was a big city built in Batir, where it was a fortress to protect Jerusalem. Then we start to think with all this, what we can do? What exactly can we do? After all this survey and data and collection, we decided to reach up an international level. We decided to go for someone who could evaluate our work. Uh, I won't uh, uh, lie to you guys. I will tell you that we were lost at that point. Of what we can do? What are the funds and the resources that we're going to gain to do all this job afterwards? As we did it on a voluntarily aspect, but then we have to go for an international level, we need more support, we need more uh, power to go ahead. Then we found this uh, advertisement online in 2000, end of 2010. So this work took us four years of collecting data and all the survey we did. And we found this um, online advertisement about an international prize called Melina Mercury Prize for landscape uh, preservation and safe gardens. It was supported by UNESCO Greece. And we said, okay, if we apply for such a prize, we can find someone, first of all, to support us. Second, they would evaluate all our work for free. Third, we might get some financial means to continue. And here, we start finding new challenges. As Palestine not, wasn't a member at UNESCO at that time, and this is strange when you hear it, but why Palestine is not a member as part of the United Nations? Because we are not recognized as a state. So if you are as a Palestinian, you try to go to reach out any international community or international institutions, you are not recognized as a human being. And this is a difficult part of the process. But we decided to continue, and we had to sneak in to the application through the Red Cross. We used the Red Cross as an international human rights association representing OPT, Occupied Palestinian Territories. We submitted all our documents and everything there, and then another challenge showed up. There are 103 projects from all over the world. We were project number 104. So our chances to win is actually less than 1%. And there were huge, big 
projects funded by strong governments like the states, Spain, France, England, Saudi Arabia. And then we looked at each other and we said, what people would think about us, these young people coming from this little town, that it's not known even to apply for such a big project. Um, I don't know, but we decided to continue anyway. But we were clear with our strategy to remain silent, not to tell anybody, for two reasons. First reason is not to be in a critical situation with the Israeli power or forces, that it will prevent us to go further. So we need to keep silent. Second, also for ourselves, if we don't win, we will just say we just tried. But if we will just start telling everyone or spread the word all over the world that we don't win, we will feel a bit ashamed. So we decided to keep our strategy on that level. Four months later, we received the first letter from the committee responsible uh, for the prize, choosing us as part of the top 10 projects applied for the prize. So this was a, a big step for us to, to, to be sure that we are on the right track, first of all. In May 2011, we received the second letter that we've been awarded the prize itself from the UNESCO Greece office. And this was the first time Palestinians, they would reach such a level and they would first of time ever receive such a certificate for such a project. And we had a meeting with Irena Bikova. She was the head of the UNESCO quarters in Paris. And she promised us that Palestine will become a member at UNESCO and that what happened November 2011, and not much people know that we and Batir were behind it. So we were able to do change as well. Thank you. Then, after this prize, we decided to think what we can do. What is our possibilities? What is our opportunities? How we could go further in our project? So we decided ecotourism. Tourism is a tool to integrate human beings together. It's something people would like to do. It's people with interest to come over countries to visit and to learn and to discover new things. So we decided to convert all our historical, historical routes that used to be connection between Jerusalem and Batir at that time or to Bethlehem or to the other towns to create it to hiking trails. And we start developing this idea by creating our book, which was called Walking Palestine. And not only for Batir, for all over West Bank, we chose 25 different uh, hike or trail. And we start developing men as a new destination for hikers, for people coming to visit the area. Then the second step, we decided to create our first eco-museum. A museum where People can go visit, learn about the history, tangible and intangible elements. But our museum, we wanted to be not in one building or in one place. We wanted to cover all over the area that we have surveyed in the project and to start focusing on how to develop more aspects in the village, like trainings, capacity buildings, more research and physical interventions where we could provide services in the village. I was mainly responsible for most of the physical, physical interventions in the village and start developing this idea of the hiking trails, choosing different locations and stations for the people where they could camp, spend the day, have a picnic. But also we start developing more ideas on how we could make these physical interventions doesn't harm the landscape doesn't harm the Palestinian cultural heritage. So we start using aspects like in this picture and how to rehabilitate or to modify the historical trails in this aspect. So it used to be like a dummy trail like this one here, then restoring this dry stone wall which was here to create what you can see. So this is also could benefit us for the future as a cultural heritage preservation project and where we could reach even more 
for our ideas and development for the village. Um, this place is one of also the old houses that was totally neglected and abandoned in the village. And we were deciding to take over the place, make a deal with the owners that we won't pay your rent. We will pay your renovation, then we will use the place as for public. So we decided to create the first guest house in the village. That was a crazy idea. Many people look at us, who could come and stay in that guest house? Who would know about Batir even to come? We said, okay, we have a strategy and we are building our database and we are building our infrastructure on where we want to reach. So this part of the process of developing the, the village, creating more facilities for people to come and to stay over and to discover the village and have some places to see, people to meet, and so on. But that was only the beginning, again. As this was only a step on where we want to reach. So after we won the prize, that was not only the achievement, that was the first step in reaching the international community. So we start to create a small community, or a small committee, sorry, where it was called Batir 2020. And this committee, it had a strategy on where do we want to reach in the village, in all aspects, and what do we want to do, and what do we want for our village. And the most important question is not what about the occupation is doing for us, or our government is doing for us, or what is the municipality is providing, what each one of us did and can do to support the village. So that was the basic or the fundamental aspect that we were preparing ourselves to. Then we went for a meeting to meet with the Ministry of Tourism, the Palestinian Ministry of Tourism, and we said we want to make our village as a World Heritage Site, supported by UNESCO. Everyone looked at us and said, are you serious? Do you know that? Do you know what that means? Are you just crazy? We said, well, maybe, but we see ourselves able to do that, especially after winning the prize. And they said, but this is a very complicated process. You won't find anybody to do it. And so we said, we will. What we need from your side is only the state presence, because as individuals, you cannot reach UNESCO or any United Nations institution. You need your state party to present you. So that's all what we are requesting from your side. And then through our connections and the work we've done for the first prize, we start going over for the progress. It took us three years of hard work. Then finally, in June 2014, we managed to make Batir the second Palestinian World Heritage Site. The first World Heritage Site was the Church of Nativity in Bethlehem, and Batir was the second one. So we again proved that we, are, as young and young people from the village, we can do change again. So this place became a World Heritage Site. What does that mean? It doesn't mean only that it's a protected site by UNESCO. It doesn't mean that it's a, a nice destination for tourists and hikers who would just come over and just enjoy their time in the village. But also, it's an unpreserved area from any farther plans of the Israeli occupation. So, in January 2011, we received the official response of the Supreme Court of Israel for stopping building the separation wall in the village. That was... That was the first Palestinian case where Palestinians managed to change an Israeli plans and to present their self on the ground and stopping such a crime that it would destroy all the rest of the village. Then, this was again another beginning because challenges never stop. Every time you reach a point, you find the new challenges. We start facing a lot of other problems or challenges in the village 
in terms of infrastructure, in terms of uh, providing facilities, training people to be local guides, collecting trash, because we cannot complain about the occupation for our internal daily life within our community. Yes, there is other problems that the occupation is doing for us. Taking our freedom is not allowing us to develop or to build new projects or infrastructure. But there are many other problems that we are responsible ourselves to manage and to be responsible on how to fix it and how to deal with it. So that's where the concept of Bacteria 2020 as a project start to show up. And we start doing a lot of activities with the kids, the students, the schools from the village as an awareness activities and awareness campaigns and how we should protect our environment, how we should protect our landscape and what we should do as people from the village toward preserving this issue. So this film was showing some of the activities that we were doing with also volunteers from um, international, international volunteers as well. And then we start giving new opportunities for the handicrafts, for all the people, the youth, the youngs, the ladies, the old men who has any talent to produce anything in the village. We decided to offer them a place as a selling point for their products and to promote their work. So in this way, we would include them in our idea or in our project by offering them a new, new income and a new work opportunities. And that's very important within our circumstances. Basically, as many people would try to find a work in the Palestinian market, there is not much uh, possibilities to find uh, work opportunities. The other option is to go and work where? In Israel, yes. So you leave your land, you don't cultivate, you don't develop any of your business, and you just go work in a settlement or in a place in Israel. So that's how they change your life rhythm from getting your own income by supporting them. So many people would say and come, yeah, but what we can do, that's the only way. We said, wait, but you are a good uh, craftsman or you are, you are good in doing this. Why don't you just make more products and we are responsible to sell it for you. We also target other many people like ladies in basic and they are shy to go out and to say we want to say okay you don't need to do that you just stay home make this product bring it to us we will offer you a space where you can sell it then you would come once a week open your box take your money and goodbye you don't need you don't need to be present all the time and this is started like as a progress to push people more toward uh, being a self-sustainable place, enriching the economy of the village, developing more agricultural lands, developing more agricultural uh, projects. And here I have to mention that my village is a well-known place for Batiri eggplant. The eggplant is a well-known brand in the village that everyone comes to the region, he would know it, and knows that there is a kind of eggplant that's famous but they don't know where is Batir located. So we start using the eggplant itself as a well-known product, again to inform people and to promote more about Batir. Then we start other activities of biking, rippling, climbing, with some other institutions around the area to bring more attention to the village. And these are some pictures of our activities, creating some events in the fields, and so on. And this is one of like the invitation also that was distributed. And this is where <coughs> the final name we gained for Batir as the land of olive and vines. Because by choosing a name for a UNESCO status, you are putting that name for history. So we were keen how to keep the name of Palestine, Jerusalem, and Batir. So that's where we came up with this long title of the land of olive and vines, cultural landscape of southern Jerusalem, Batir. So this name will be forever, hopefully, present there. And the last thing I would finish my presentation with is this view, where it's showing a lookout from one of the terraces in the village, and here 
it's showing the railway over here is Jerusalem, all the way down here is Jaffa and to go to the coastal area. And this place is uh, the first school which was built in 1886. The first school was which built in the region. Now today it's still a school, but here from this view you can see the border. This is the border. So Israelis when they come up and they want to build the wall, they were choosing this part to build it. So they will isolate the school, all these farmlands is our land, and to, to, to cut us totally from the extension of the lands of the farming land on the other side. So I was always wondering how to preserve this view. So I made a small simulation just to give you an idea on how the situation will look like after. So this is exactly what Israel wanted for us. This is exactly what they want to build for a better future. So if they are calling for a peace process, or calling for a two-state solution, ten-state solution, one-state solution, I don't mind and I don't care. But this is what we will really gain at the end. This is exactly where we will end up. Again, it was this one, and that was the plan. But we managed to keep it this one for now. Thank you for listening. I'm sorry, it was too long. Yes, uh, we have uh, time for some questions, if any of you have. And thank you again. all the time, especially when you're fighting for something that seems so um, unrealistic. And, and you talked about it just a little bit, but as people who, who um, have had the privilege of seeing this today, um, how do you kind of go about reminding everyone that they're fighting for the same cause? How do you keep up that morale? Like, how do you, um, how do you, how do you keep people motivated, I think is my question. Well, uh, this is a very important uh, question because um, to keep your spirit up, to keep you motivated, it was the hardest challenge we've been facing. But let me tell you, it, let me answer you that from a different aspect. When the people of the village in the beginning heard about uh, the plan for the Israeli wall to build, uh, to build the wall and to start construction and to bring the bulldozers to the site, everyone was like disappointing and this is gonna happen and no one could stop the Israelis from doing that so we lost every single hope that the people might had at that time but then when we started our project and we start telling people they called us the crazy ones a few years later we succeed and the people saw that so they start getting engaged more in the project and that was a necessary step to motivate them and to keep engaging them for further projects. So what we do nowadays, you just go to Batir, walk in the village, you find simple farmers cultivating or doing their daily farming work in the terraces. Some visitors or hikers or people coming to visit the village will go greet them, say what do you have, what kind of vegetables do you have today? Then they show up and they sell it to them. This kind of reaction, it keeps people motivating. Keeps people that there is hope. There is still another mean of life. People are reaching us, they are learning about us, and they are dealing with them from a zero distance. Zero distance definition is an important one because it's the most effective um, relation it could create or change it could create. I hope this was an enough answer. Thank you so much. You're okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hassan. Great talk. 
Um, I was wondering, in a lot of your uh, pictures, there's a lot of pine trees in the background of the hills. I'm wondering if you could uh, explain those, the significance and how the pine trees shape the environment, and then uh, maybe shed a little light on how you personally have uh, been able to resist those, uh, those trees. OK, you know some of the secrets. That's why you just come up with this question. Um, well, the pine tree story is uh, like a big challenge that we faced all over during our process, and we're still facing this problem and this challenge, as we call it the environmental cancer. First of all, the, these pine trees are not native in Palestine. They were first brought to the country during the British mandate period. Then after it was adopted by Israeli, um, what they call it, kibbutz. It's a small outpost started in the 20s and the 30s before the creation of uh, the State of Israel after the Nakba. And they start studying exactly how they could benefit out of nature to support their colonizational way. So they used these pine trees as a big tool, an important tool to spread all over the region where they can control it after by the Nature Preservation Authority or Authority of Nature in Israel. So they start spreading more these trees in the beginning, after during the 30s, and after more in 1948 and onward, to plant it over the Palestinian destroyed towns and villages. So all this mountain that you see over here, these mountains, the, these are occupied Palestinian villages in 1948 where the Kakal, or the Karan Kemet, which was mainly supported by GNF, Jewish National Fund, to plant these trees in memorial of some Jewish people or international or famous people all over the world. So maybe this is worth mentioning also, the mountain over there is called Yad Kennedy National Park. So it was named after John Kennedy. So all these pine trees is part of the memorial of John Kennedy there. But the reason behind planting these trees was also not only spreading and controlling the land, but to keep it growing on a natural way that people will, won't recognize it. So the pine trees mainly create three important things for the soil. First, they create high pH in the soil where it kills other type of plants around it. So it will destroy any Palestinian native cultivation. Second, it creates this kind of waxy material where it's spread all over the area, so it gives more space for the seeds and the new seeds to spread. Third, it doesn't need a deep land to grow up for the roots, so it could grow in anywhere. And this is where we call it part of the colonized by conifers, where the seeds just spread and then the trees would grow up. But also there was another important aspect to hide all the um, remains or the ruins of the Palestinian villages. So when these trees were planted around these villages, the roots of, of these trees it will keep searching for nitrogen. So it would go and look for the small cracks in between the stones. So it will go in the remains of the Palestinian towns or structures and it will even work naturally in destroying them slowly. So after 50 years, if you would look to this mountain, many people would come there and say, wow, you have a beautiful village with green mountains full of olive, full of pine trees. But they don't know there is 500 houses and reservoirs that are under these pine trees. It's totally damaged and destroyed. So for us, the pine trees, it's a cancer. It's a, a tool for the colonization system to continue. And it's... Um, Unfortunately, difficult to fight because you would get a fine up to $15,000 if you try to cut any of these trees as a Palestinian. Yeah, even if it grows in your land. So if you try to cut any of these trees, you will get that fine. Um, the last thing also about these trees, where we try to find a, a way to stop it from spreading, that was my, my specific job. Uh, to find a solution for that. I found the research uh, in 
Norway, in Australia, and in Canada using copper. And copper needles, just to put it next to it, and then the trees will die naturally after a year or so. And I tried this experience there, and it worked. So now I am... <laughs> Well, I'm telling this loudly now, but now I'm trying to do a big project about that in the area. So maybe my next presentation using another picture will not show much of these trees, hopefully. Thank you. Any other more questions? Hi. Um, so throughout your presentation, uh, you may, I, I just want you to comment on kind of what the Israelis do now to harass your village or what presence they have even though you are protected by UNESCO or you have that title. Okay, the UNESCO status we gained five years ago, it was important to reach international level and to get international presence on the ground. But since that time, also there was many uh, changes, uh, especially after Israel and the United States dropped out of the uh, dropped out of UNESCO. So Israel started neglecting many UNESCO decisions on the ground, and that affected us directly on the ground in Batir that UNESCO were not able to support us much enough nowadays for the challenges that we are facing. And one of them recently, uh, a group of settlers, they just came up in the core zone of the World Heritage Site in the village and they confiscated a spot of land around 4,000 meters square. And uh, UNESCO didn't do much about that. So we had to go to the settlers and to reach them out and to say, what are you doing here? This is a UNESCO site and they didn't give any damn about it. And then we asked them, okay, what's your plan to do here? And they surprised me by the answers that they want to grow olive trees. So this time they're finding a new strategy to grow olive trees, olive trees in place of pine trees. And unfortunately, it was a project to bring the settlers from the northern part of West Bank from a settlement called Alon Moray and it was supported and funded by the Israeli Nature and Park Authority, which they have the full power and support nowadays to do what they want. So after all that, I reported all this, me and my team we reported all this to UNESCO office in Ramallah, and we didn't get an answer of what they're going to take as an action to prevent them or what it's the procedure that UNESCO might do to preserve this and unfortunately uh, now there is no action and we are worried that by Israel dropping out of UNESCO there will be more kind of these actions taking to the place without giving uh, any importance to the UNESCO decisions or to United Nations decisions. Thank you. Maybe um, I'm so happy that I made it finally here. Even my journey to the States was like an unexpected one. Because uh, maybe this is a last thing I would mention. Um, for a Palestinian to get a visa to the States is, might be the most difficult things you would do ever in your life. <laughs> and I never thought of that unless I tried it myself. So uh, it was... Um, very complex and difficult process facing uh, the interview that they made for me in the embassy in Jerusalem, asking me about Hamas, Iran, Hezbollah, Syria, Iraq, I 
And I said, why, until now you haven't asked me why I'm going to the States? Why you are asking me about all these people? Uh, why you haven't asked me about why I'm, I'm going to the States? And he looks at me, we will come to that afterwards. <laughs> okay, thank you very much.